Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here. My title is Chief Technology Officer. I'm not a technology freak. But where I'm freak is that what technologies can enable. So that's really the topic. So uh, my daughter was laughing to me when I told him that uh, I, I'm, I have written a contract with Fortum to be a chief technology officer because she knows my technology skills at home. So it was <laughs> so, so much funny for her, her. Or last summer I got a Lego wave roller wave power plant from, from AW Energy and I started to build that model. So I needed only a little bit help from my husband. But, but it's really about what it enables, and that makes me excited, what we can achieve with technologies. I'm going to talk you, just give a brief uh, uh, description of Fortum strategy, then I'm going to, to energy sector, what exciting things are happening there, and then I will go to case studies, what we are dealing with in Fortum, very different types, different stories. We have had uh, nearly two years a new strategy, some important points there. Customers play more and more important role in this sector. Digitalization is enabler. And what I'm extremely happy, we have the, uh, there uh, one important part of strategy, build new energy ventures. We see that we need these new things, and that is where I'm working my, my actually all the time. We have had a vision of solar economy, I would say, 10 years. In the beginning, we were said that you are crazy. Do you really believe in that? And what it really means? Risto told you about these uh, steam engines and how industrialization came. And that came with fossil, fossil fuels. But we have to move from, from there to more efficient ways to produce energy. But we have to move to renewables. Total renewables, that's must. In the beginning when we made this, we said it's a tens of years of journey. Well, it is, but we started to see the impacts actually sooner. And, and three years ago, we added these balloons there. We need something to make the system work. We need a lot of flexibility. And, and uh, in the consumption side also, we need storages, we need everything. And just recently, we understood that we can't look energy as uh, energy alone. Energy is integrated with traffic, it's integrated with waste, it's integrated with bioeconomy. It's really a comprehensive view. So you really need a systemic understanding of this, how these things interact and, and, and uh, what, how, how to manage there and how to find an excellent solutions. Uh, when things happen fast and, and there are, are some tipping points or disruption happening, economists are quite lousy trying to predict what is happening. Here you see the IEA, International Energy Agency, has made forecast how wind and solar power uh, uh, um, uh, capacities will, will develop globally. And, and you can see that these are the... Uh, year 2006, 7, 8, etc., etc., always they have been wrong. And they still are quite modest, they are improving, but economists tend to think linearly. And it's very difficult to bring these kind of tipping points to their models. So that's, that's the reason for that, but that means also that you can't believe in these for, uh, scenarios. You have to understand how they are made and you have to have a vision of things that might, might change the world. And of course, it's a challenging that when you should go there and work there, but this is the risk you have to take. You have to go there before you really see that now it's happening. Then it's too late. Another case is battery technologies. Just in some five, six years, the costs have declined to nearly one-fourth what it was in 2010. And that enables a lot of things, if you think that you can store energy much cheaper than you have done before. So a lot of different things is, is hap happening. What is challenging in energy is that we are not in the same position globally. Here, 
I hope we still have winter and summer. So uh, that means also that it's a difference in consumption of energy in summer and winter. When, when you are uh, in, in, around the equator, it's quite balanced. There, the solar power is the cheapest electricity production method, but for us, it's wind. And we have to find our best own system, how we balance it. We can't copy from somebody else that, okay, that works there, let's take that. So we have to be, uh, have, have tailor-made so solutions. Here you see some prices of these renewable technologies, what we have had lately. Uh, we have prices below 30 euros per megawatt hour, which is very, very low. Here for uh, solar, 27, uh, wind, 27, solar, 26, Sweden, uh, wind, 36. So this clearly shows that actually renewables is now in most parts of the world already the cheapest way to produce electricity. That's a huge change and enabler to us. And, and that also speeds the development what we need to tackle climate change. But here you can see the implications. It's, it will not be easy. This is from Germany already uh, three years ago. Then they had some little over 10% wind and solar in the system. Here you have the conventional power. Green one is wind and yellow is solar. You can see in solar, sun rises up in the morning, goes down in the evening. So it's quite uh, stable how it goes. But you always need in the morning and uh, in the evening the conventional power to take those morning and evening, evening peaks. Wind is not so easy to predict. And here you can see quite interesting week. From Monday to Friday, hardly no wind. And Friday evening, a huge amount of wind coming to the system, meaning that the traditional uh, capacity has to go down something like two times the capacity in Finland. So that puts the whole system in really challenging situation. And what is even more interesting, that the price in the market is negative. You are paid that you use electricity. It's quite a huge philo philosophical change. And this, here we had only some 10% of renewables. Think when we have 50, 60, 70, 80%. So you can multiply the impact. So it's really exciting. And that's how you can see that we need all the resources to keep the system up and running. That was what is happening in energy at this moment. Then I have picked case examples. We are working in Fortum, and they are quite different from each other, and, and they have somehow, somehow personal angle, which is the reason I have picked them. And actually, when Risto made his presentation in the beginning, there were quite a lot of same things that he pointed out that I have in these examples. I'll start from electric vehicle revolution. We have for, in Fortum, we have a charge and drive uh, service. We started it in Norway. Now we are in, in 11 countries. We, work it, uh, we provide it, it as Fortum solution or, or as a cloud-based solution to the other players, as a white-label solution. But I think we are now in very interesting point with electric vehicles. They are really booming. Uh, they help a lot in, in the cities with the local emission problems. And, for example, Bloomberg is, is saying that by 2025 they will be cheaper than conventional cars. Then I hear, okay, this will happen in electric uh, uh, personal cars, but not in, in heavy traffic, not in airplanes. But what we see in the development, uh, there is a lot of development comp going on with uh, four trucks and, and uh, lorries. So I believe it will come, perhaps later on, and there's development also going in, in air traffic. So, so um, things that people say that that's not possible, then it takes a, small a short time and then you start seeing, hmm, that might be possible and that might change a lot of different things. And when we also understand that electrification is key also to tackle climate change, so that is also a very important fact. Case number two. 
virtual power plant. This is about digitalization. This is about customers, what it can make. And this is actually also about Finland, what is possible in Finland. So what we have done, we have worked with households who have water heaters. And, and uh, we have aggregated them together and we have made a deal with Fingrid, which is, it is a grid company in Finland, that, that we will sell that capacity to Fingrid to keep the, the frequency in the grid in balance. So this 50 hertz, when it's variating, you always need something to, to balance it. And uh, we have done that agreement according to normal uh, commercial agreements what Fingrid has. This is not possible in most of the countries globally. What is very important is that people always get warm water. When you want to go to shower, you get warm water. So, so uh, that we will not, never uh, compromise. It has to be comfortable to people and they have to get something to participate in the system. And in the first pilot, it was great to see that we asked people, why did you join? They want to do something for the climate. They want to do something new, new things. They want to feel that they are part of that. So it has been really, really good to see that people want to participate, but you have to make it easy. So that's, that's uh, very important. And we call this a spring. This is a spring which brings flexibility to the system for, from these small uh, assets we already have in the system. And the idea is to build a virtual power plant, oops, to now, yes, to, uh, to bring different types of, of sources to the power system, to help the power system. And the more we can help power system, the more we can bring wind to the power system, and the more renewable and CO2 free will the power system be. And this is digitalization is enabler for this, but we not need also such a regulation model that enables that we are able to do that. So this is something that we had done I don't know whether we were first globally, but among the first ones to really do this. Third case example is something what Risto said that, that whether <coughs> development is now the fastest, but it will be even faster in the future. And uh, here, this is somehow, for me, it was really an eye-opener. I was sitting with uh, having a Christmas dinner with my family uh, during Christmas 2015. And uh, our son asked that, do you know blockchain, what it is? And no, never heard of that. Well, then he ex explained what it is. It is related to bitcoins. And as I said, I'm not a technology freak. Then my, I asked him that, have you thought that what blockchain can do in energy sector? He said, hmm, that's a very good question, I don't know. And then after Christmas, I was working, I went to office, I didn't have too many meetings, so I, I had time to just to Google and, and, and uh, trying to look in internet. Is there anything about blockchain and energy? I didn't find any, I, at least I didn't find any links that the, they both were together. Blockchain you had there. Then I went to uh, many colleagues, especially young colleagues, that, that uh, do you know blockchain? Yeah, yeah, I know it. Uh, what do you think about blockchain and energy? And I could see light bulb uh, blinking on their head when they started to think that what it could be. And, and um, it really is something that it could disrupt the energy sector. Uh, but it took only a couple of months when we already noticed some first case studies, uh, Brooklyn uh, uh, case study, or uh, uh, whatever, whatever startups pump, uh, popped up. And now there are some at least over 30 blockchain uh, startups. But what we did, I didn't, I, I still have, I'm struggling understanding blockchain. 
It has been explained to me tens of times, but it's hard. But we went out, we talked that, oh, this is interesting, blockchain and energy, and what happened? We were able to get contacts that who were good, good at that, and we were able to start working together with those who are good in that, and, and uh, to develop cases together. So this is a learning. Uh, go out, speak about things, and you find people who, who are much brighter than you are and can help and work together with you. But the how, how I see how it can disrupt energy sector is that my fridge can be an equal in energy market as, as Fortum's hydropower plant. And, and it can enable in developing markets the, the energy system work. So, but now it's hype. Let's see how it will go on. So that we will still see, but we have to be there so that we understand what it ena enables, what we can do with it. Then, case number four. This is something Risto didn't talk. I don't remember he talked about horse manure. Uh, but what, uh, why I picked this one? We had our first uh, innovation accelerator in our company, 2014. Two guys non from nuclear power risk management came to the program. Hey, we have this kind of idea that what if we would sell service to host tables to bring the bedding them and take the manure out and you use that manure, for example, in our power plants? That's really circular economy. And now, this is an internal startup. Uh, another of these nuclear risk guys is, is heading this startup. Um, they are active in Finland, they are starting operations in Sweden, they have over 2,000 horses as their customers, so it's really, uh, the need is there. And, and the process was so funny that two times the business said, it doesn't work, we have tried it before, it doesn't work, we don't want this, this is not our core business. But we were able to keep that in, in, in Fortum, and now it really is internal startup. And this year there is this um, international horse show in, in Helsinki, and they will use only electricity made of, of horse manure. And it's a huge uh, news. This is news from New Zealand, so they picked that news. So, so it's so uh, close to people, it's easy to understand, and, and uh, it, it's, it's really great to see the whole journey in this innovation program and to see the product, that how, how people take it. This is something that Risto talked. He talked about uh, poverty, how to help, help them. And this is also a story of open innovation, what we are doing. So there are still hundreds of millions of people without electricity globally. There are a lot of uh, local entrepreneurs who are um, selling uh, uh, solar panels. And uh, typically the local people can't afford to buy the panels. So they buy it, they, they, they buy it uh, as a service. So the, typically they pay in advance and, and uh, then use solar power. What we are now doing together with Futurize, so we have actually, uh, we are sharing the risk there to work together. And uh, we want to develop, make for these entrepreneurs easy to make this happen. So they bring the equipment, they install them, but we help them in, in measuring the consumption in uh, mobile payment, so that they don't have to do that. And uh, we don't know yet whether we are, we are uh, successful. We hopefully are able to start piloting in India in, in just a couple of months. But if this is successful, we, it might end that we'll, it will be a startup what we together with Futurize then own and bring that forward. And, and when you have these kind of cases that you really, you really see that you can act as an enabler, it really is something that, that um, may inspires you a lot. And, and, and uh, it can come from so different things that uh, where the inspiration comes and the technologies what you have there. This is one of the cases I really find 
very interesting and potential. Then I have my last case, and I could have used my all half an hour for this case. What do you see here? You can see straw which is burnt in the fields. If you have traveled in China or India and outside main, main cities, you can see this. I was taking train from Beijing to, to uh, southwest, some 500 kilometers, all the way I saw farmers burning straw in the fields. This is a huge pollution and it pollutes also the cities. Some estimation is that around 30% of the pollution in the cities is because of this. Straw is also biomass. So could we find something to use this straw in much wiser way than only burning in the fields? Of course, it brings some nutrients, but you, it doesn't need to be done that way. This is what Risto talked. Plastic waste in oceans. And that's only the visible plastic waste. Then there is this uh, microplastics that you don't even see, which is typically coming from, from textile uh, fleas, for example, when you wash it in the washing machine. It always releases these micro, microplastics. It's all there in the oceans. Can we do something that we don't get this? Huge global problems. And this is what we have now been thinking. Can we build biowend? And if we think what I talked about energy sector and, uh, and uh, bringing renewables, solar and wind, to the system. So the similar for other fossil industry. Can we really disrupt it? And, and we think that the, that could be biovende, and we need uh, hundreds of companies and, and uh, tens of thousands of people to work for that. But we really see that that could be something, and, and especially coming from Finland, uh, Nordics, where we have a lot of biomass and we have worked in that. What do we mean with biovende? There are a lot of different types of biomasses available. This is straw uh, here, and, and uh, bamboo is actually a grass, very fast growing um, grass in, in many countries. And we have also a, a wood uh, forests. And uh, that is non food lignocellulosic biomass. Nowadays, still, when you use biomass for, for example, liquid biofuels, sometimes it's coming from the food sector. But this definitely is non-food sector we want to focus. Are we able to develop a technology that fractions the biomass? And when I mean fractions, it fractions, fractions it immediately to hemicellulosa, cellulosa, and lignin, and then you can process further those, uh, those parts. With the purity in those uh, intermediate products it's high, is high. Perhaps you can build on something more on that. And there is already a lot of happening. What you can produce of biomass? What if this was not made of oil? And it was made of biomass and it was biodegradable. That's a huge area where we use, use fossils. Paints, they have pigments. Perhaps we can use biomass to produce pigments to paints. Carbon fiber, cars, airplanes, a lot of, of different things. You could even talk about, talk about uh, replacing graphene in battery storages. Use lignin, uh, lignin for that. There are already some, some, uh, uh, so, some things uh, made in lab scale. Can we go to industrial scale faster? We should be able to do that faster. And then what is really exciting, textile. 
If you think how yarn is produced today, cotton, um, it's very comfortable. We know that you can't have more cotton fields we have nowadays. And actually cotton is using a lot of uh, pesticides, a lot of water. Could that be replaced? Viscose, that is uh, made of biomass, but the production um, is very polluting. Can we replace that, that process? And we have made actually one uh, estimate that if we have a fee wheat field where we use the grain for food industry, and then we would use the straw, uh, first fractionate it, and then use one of these new, new textile technologies to produce yarn. We came to a conclusion that if you could use 30% of that straw, you could get as much yarn as, as from cotton field, and you wouldn't then have to burn the straw in the fields. You would use it for, for, to produce products, textiles, in much more environmental way as we do nowadays. And the textiles would not have these microplastics, which is now in the seas. Huge, I would say this is a huge global challenge, but as Risto said, you should look at the opportunities. This is also a huge opportunity globally. To actually, you, you would, could have an impact to so many sectors. You could have impact on, on uh, uh, climate change. You could have impact on, on uh, not using the uh, unsustainable fossil resources. You could have impact on this plastic waste in, in seas and, and everywhere else. Uh, it would have a huge social impact if you think that, yet, that you would have this kind of uh, biorefinery in, in Asia, uh, in China, India, using bamboo as raw material. That would bring employment and, and welfare to thousands of people only with one biorefinery. So it's a huge global opportunity and, and we really we are really working for that. Of course, the journey is long, but we try to find out the ways how we can make the development faster, what we could do, do for that. But the challenges are huge, and, and we can see everywhere challenges, but actually they, you can see them as opportunities. So we want to have all, all of you to join, join the chain, chains and I think women in tech are definitely one, the ones who are able to make this chain, change. So I'm happy that you all are here and I'm so happy that I've been able to share this uh, energy sector, uh, what is happening there and these our case studies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Haley, for those wonderful cases, for that in, in, inspiring story, which was quite different from Jessica's personal story, where actually, you know, you came and said, you know, you're not a technology freak, though you are, you know, a, a doctor of control engineering from, you know, you, the University of Tampere, but you're it not. Just a, happened. It just happened, you yeah. know. <laughs> Uh, but I'm not, you know, technology free, and you know, I don't know how, really how blockchain works, though it's been explained to me at that. I love this. I mean, this is only a Finnish engineer would say that publicly, uh, and and a, and a female engineer. The, the humility is wonderful, but also what was inspiring about your talk was that you talked about how your children inspired you, mm -hmm. and that amazing curiosity you have to learn about all of these things. So I think curiosity is, is something that has permeated the, your entire presentation. How do you keep this curiosity to solve all these wicked problems alive? I guess is one thing that comes up from all the tweets that we have received. <laughs> um, they, they are so inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> we have to solve them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and if you start thinking this, this uh, how to solve this, and, and is there something that you can do for that? and forget the things that you cannot impact. Don't, don't use the energy for those things. Use it for the things that you can have an impact. 
That's 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 great great advice, and I I love I love your your you know a lot of the stories. One was you know there's a great book called Freakonomics, which which goes through the story of, yeah. of you know you read this yeah. this book of how how you know horse horse manure was killing our cities 120 years ago. Mm-hmm. You know there was they were predicting horse poo to go to the third floor in Manhattan, uh, and the, the solution became fossil fuels. That was the solution to horse poo. Mm. But now horse poo is becoming the solution to fossil fuels. Uh, exactly. yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. a wonderful story of, of how that... Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and do you know that during uh, 1920s in London, you have to cancel the, the theater sometimes because there was so much smoke that you couldn't see the play. It has to be canceled. That, that, uh, <laughs> that's crazy. We're, we're living in actually cleaner times. That. But, but, but they need to get cleaner. Uh, of, of all of these, I mean, these are six very different areas. I mean, Fortum is a big company. Now you've, you've, you're going into to, to Germany, uh, doing all kinds of, uh, all kinds of the, a company that's doing all kinds of things. Uh, these are all very different technology challenges. You know, looking at the electric vehicles, looking at the grid and how we can, you know, use that in an innovative way, blockchain, horsepower. These are, you know, shouldn't you be prioritizing, focusing? I mean, what's, what's uh, you know, you, you look like a propelipa, as they call it, you know, <laughs> which is nice, but I mean, you have a business to run. So, so how do you make these choices when you're, when you're in, in this kind of position? Well, uh, I think the, most of the cases I presented, actually all of them, are in very early stages. Okay. And what Risto said was also about the predictability. You really can't predict for the future what it will be. In the, in the history, we, we had it, and then we, okay, we, we sold our power to the, to the uh, uh, power marketplace, and we were happy with that. Then we found out that that will not continue forever like that. We have to have some new businesses. And um, in the early, you, you must not kill them in too early stages. So you, you have to work with them at some stages. It might be that some of those what I presented will not be Fortum business. Some of them might be stopped. Mm. Some of them we might sell to somebody. But we, are, we have to work with several things to find what will be the new things for Fortum. That, that, that is so inspiring. I really want to thank you on behalf of all of us for sharing your inspiration, your openness, your curiosity for all these wonderful technologies. You're an inspiration. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, everybody, we, uh, we are now looking at a well-deserved break. What do you say? I'm going to let you go and uh, give you a half an hour. Please go and see our partners. There are all kinds of things happening out there. VR technology, artificial intelligence. But half an hour, be back here for inspirational, out-of-this-world space presentation after the break. Thank you.